Well, if you were with us last week, we began a new series titled The Art of Neighboring. And last week, we really focused on what is called the great commandment that Jesus gave us, that we should love the Lord our God with all our hearts, all our souls, all our minds, and all our strength. And he gave us the second, which is to love our neighbor as ourselves. And we built our foundation upon that great commandment. And this week, I want to zero us in just a little bit more. I wanna help us hone in just a tad bit more on loving our neighbor, our art of neighboring, and and more specifically what I mean by that is I'd like us to not only consider the importance of neighboring in our context outside of our building, but I also want us to remember that there is an important context of neighboring with the people who sit to your left and your right this morning, with specifically with the people of God and how, how we love one another as brethren, how we love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, obviously, that does extend us outward. That's kind of a starting point with God into our brothers and sisters going out into the world, but it bears repeating because it has so much rich emphasis in the teaching of the New Testament that we must also love our brothers and sisters. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I want you to please open them. Join me in 1 John chapter 3. We're going to begin in verse 11. We're going to read from verse 11 to 18. If you're willing and if you're able during this time, if you would, please stand with me as we read God's word. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. So do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for our brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Father, we pray this morning that you would open our hearts to learn from your word to love in deed and in truth. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I wanna give you just a little bit of context into the uh, book of First John to this awesome letter. Now, our, our ladies' Bible study just finished working through this, uh, this epistle from John, and so I know that they're probably taking notes right now, preparing to give me the critical feedback in the, in the post-worship time period. I pray that I would be able to give you everything that you already learned and just continue to reinforce those things that you studied for the past several weeks. I know that it was fruitful and I pray that this just further encourages you to stay in the word. But John in his letter, as he, as he delivers his message to the people that he's writing to, to his audience, and specifically as he's, as he's guiding them and, and teaching them, John kind of works through these funnels or these, these spirals of, of emphases. And he, he really has three basic emphases in mind, three emphases that are central to Christian foundational character, their central traits of the Christian person. And he's describing them and he's bringing them and he comes back to them repeatedly and he's honing us in to see true Christianity and what it really looks like. And in the three spirals, if you will, that he works through repeatedly involve doctrine, obedience, and love. And as John provides these different spirals down into understanding more about what true doctrine and how that relates to the believer and and true obedience and how that relates to the believer and true love and how that relates to the believer, John gives us these these different verses that he's often very, 
very tough on us with. He's kind of shows us a perfect picture of tough and tender because John is very loving, but he's also unwilling to budge on the truth. So John shows us these different things. One example might be this in, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. One of the examples of a kind of test that John gives to his readers, he says, do not love the world or the things in the world. And if, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So he's giving us a test to understand that if, if we have this love for the things of the world, and the love of the Father is not in us. He's trying to help us shape and hone our understanding of the true Christian life, and even more so, probably helping us ask the question of well, what does it really look like to be a true Christian, and even a self kind of litmus test, well, how am I doing in my Christian walk? What does my life look like, and is John describing or helping me to really convict my heart of the things that maybe I'm unwilling to let go of? like ongoing sin in my life. Because he says, if you have ongoing sin, you need to be asking yourself the question, have you been saved or are you deceiving yourself? So John gives us these traits, these tests. Now, very important to understand, John doesn't separate these. These aren't just different boxes that he's put things in and said, you've gotta have doctrine, you're gonna have obedience, you're gonna have love, and they're all three separate. No, and in John's mind, these things are intimately connected. They are tied together. You might even say that there's a kind of cascade that we see happen. True belief and true faith and, and right doctrine leads to obedience, and obedience is expressed through love. The three main traits that John works through, doctrine, obedience, and love, and they're connected, they're tied together, they cascade into one another so that as we grow in obedience, as we grow in, in, our, in our understanding of who Christ is and what he's done for us, our understanding of God's massive, unending, impenetrable love for us, as we grow in that understanding, we, we give our lives more and more and more to him, and specifically that looks like, or that plays out in our love for God and for his people, especially love for his people. John continues to come back to love for the brethren, love for our brothers and sisters, love for the body of Christ. I would tell you this this morning. I believe that love as a characteristic is the defining trait of a Christian. A true Christian, their defining trait, when you look at them, it should look like loving God and loving the brethren. And we're immediately drawn into this right out of the gate in verse 11 as we open this morning, where John says, you've heard this from the beginning. This is the message that you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, but what? But like Jesus, who, who gives us the perfect picture of love because he laid down his life for ours. Now, I wanna quickly stay on this for just a moment, that, that we've heard this message from the beginning. This is the message of Christ. This is Christ's message to his disciples. And I think we, we, should, we should look back to the echo of how John is giving us this emphasis, especially in the way that Christ initially gave it to us. And, and we could see that if we turned in our Bibles to John chapter 13. If you'd like to join me there, one of the most beautiful sounds on Sunday morning is the paper of the Bible's turning. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, it's the fourth gospel. If you're looking for it, it's in the New Testament. So go about two thirds of the way through your Bible and then it is John chapter 13. I just wanna read this quickly to you. This is Jesus saying, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. And then Jesus qualifies it even further. He says, I want you to love one another, not just by your own parameters, but I want you to love one another as I have loved you, that you also may have love for one another. And, and then this, in verse 35, 1335, Jesus says, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This is the defining trait, the characteristic that Jesus gives us by which we will be known as his disciples. It's the one that he gave to his disciples. It's the one that we can carry on as his disciples today. The defining trait of our lives, 
to love one another, that we would love our brothers and sisters, that this would be what the outside world sees when they look at us. I don't know anything about those Christian people, but they love one another. It is our defining trait. It is a central and significant importance. So my, my first question to you this morning, what is your defining trait? If someone had to come to you and give you in one sentence what defines you as a person, or maybe even more specifically, let me say this. If they had to say, this is how this person behaves. This is the kind of actions that I see in their life. And these actions are reflective of one specific character trait. Is that trait going to be that you're loving? Is loving the leading trait in your life? Is it something else? What do you think drives it to be something else? Might it be that you're known as a tough guy? This guy is tough. Or maybe you're a hard worker. You're known as the worker. You're the workhorse. You, you don't put anything before work. You're going to get things done. And I would just ask you to, to consider God's word, to consider Christ's words, that we'll be known as his disciples by our love for each other. And what must it take for you this morning to consider that and then consider your life and look at the ways that you can change your simple daily activities in order to better represent what Jesus desires for us to do, which is to love each other, to give ourselves over to loving one another. Now you might ask, as, as I probably would ask, I might be confused because maybe I don't know exactly what that means. How can I know what loving versus what not loving looks like? How do I understand if that is at least becoming a character trait that I consider of most importance? How can I measure, how can I judge this? What do I know the difference between love and hate is? And we notice something in, in 1 John. One thing that John does that I think is, is bold, but it can also be a tad bit harsh to us sometimes, is his way of, of leaving very little neutral ground. He says, if, if you don't love your brother, you don't have God's love. And he doesn't really leave a whole lot of gray area. He doesn't leave much neutral zone for us to try to wiggle our way out of that. So John, in that manner, gives us a contrast. And this is not uncommon in scripture. We see contrasts all over the place. One, one that pops to my mind right out of the gate is Psalm 1. We see the contrast of the righteous man and the wicked man and, and a description of how they live their life. And here in John, or 1 John chapter 3, we see John give us, he also begins chapter 3 by kind of giving us a righteous versus unrighteous, but he also, as we lead into our passage this morning, gives us a contrast between what hate looks like and what love looks like. And you will notice that John doesn't give us a mushy middle where we can kind of love, but kind of hate. He says there's love and there's hate. And the importance of love and hate is it tells you what's coming from the inside out. It tells you who your father is. It tells you who you belong to. It tells you who's dwelling within your own heart? What things are you giving the most attention to? What defining trait do you have that you're leaning on right now that helps us to understand, am I a child of God? Has Christ given his life for me? And have I received that? And, that, and therefore his spirit is working in me to transform me so that I do start to love my brethren? Or am I still stuck abiding in death Son of Satan, not a child of God. This is an important question we have to ask. This, this should convict us to consider our actions and our behaviors in such a way that we look deeply within ourselves and consider what have I believed upon and who have I looked at as a savior. So John gives us a few different, he gives us several contrasting statements. He kind of goes back and forth between what love looks like, what love doesn't look like. I'm gonna give you just a few this morning. The first thing that we see um, in verse 12, right out of the gate, he tells us, love one another, verse 11, then goes into verse 12, but don't love one another as Cain, because Cain was of the wicked one. We already begin to see this 
distinction. Cain didn't love because Cain was of the wicked one and he murdered his brother. So our first sign, hate versus love, hate kills, hate murders, hate destroys life. Cain killed his brother. Do you remember, you, you recall the story of Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel, Genesis chapter four, the brothers both come to God to present an offering. Abel's offering is a sacrifice and it's, it's deemed worthy, it's deemed acceptable by God. Cain's sacrifice is deemed unacceptable. Now what we learn is not that God was just simply judging their sacrifice, God was actually judging the motivations of their hearts. Cain's motivation was evil and wicked. We can see that as his brother did something righteous, he did something wicked. He was evil in his thoughts. And here's where it gets very important. This is where I think we need to be very, very careful. This is why John draws such a hard distinction between love and hate. Because we might be tempted to say, well, I love my brother, but you know, I really, I just can't stand him, I hate him. And as soon as that thought, as soon as that poison enters our heart, it begins to play itself out in murder. And this is how he describes it. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. Now you might be saying, well, that's really strong language, John, and I don't quite understand that. And I think we can actually go to Jesus for a little bit of help in this. In in Matthew chapter five, Jesus speaks on on a similar tone. He speaks in a similar subject. Matthew chapter five, beginning in verse 21, this is Jesus speaking now. He says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. Very important, next verse. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of judgment of the council, but whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hell fire. This is Jesus warning us. This is Jesus himself in a similar vein telling us that as soon as hate begins to creep up in your heart, it's akin to murdering your brother. And you stand in a very dangerous position where judgment will be upon you. It starts from our hearts and works its way out. So the second question we must ask ourselves this morning is, where is your heart for your brother? Now I know what I usually do is I think about, I immediately begin to think about all the people that I, that I clearly love. I think about the people whom, whom it's easy for me to love. But I need to make sure that I think about the people who it's somewhat difficult to love. And there are those of us who are difficult to love. We all have been in those situations where you love someone, but you just, they're difficult to love. You're, it's hard on you to love them. Here's another litmus test that you might consider. When you look at someone, it might be easy to show them love when they're down and out. It might be easy to look at your brother or sister and say, I love them, he's struggling right now, and then so you're, you're giving him a helping hand and, and you're praying for him and you're encouraging them, but let me ask you this. Do you have the same sentiment and the same types of love for your brother or sister when they're succeeding? This one is a very tricky one because our human nature is so achievement-oriented. Our human nature is so competitive to an extent that sometimes we get upset when our brother or sister succeeds beyond us. You might be thinking, well, where did you get that idea from? Well, we just talked about it in Cain and Abel, didn't we? Didn't we just see that in Cain? Cain didn't offer a good sacrifice. His heart was in the wrong place, but Abel offered a good sacrifice. Abel came and was received. His sacrifice was received by God. It wasn't just Cain seeing Abel and hating him. He he hated him because his deeds were righteous. Now, not coincidentally, this helps us to understand John's statement here where he says, do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you because the world hates righteous acts. So it's gonna make it all the harder for us to love people back knowing that they're going to be, for lack of a better way to say it, they're gonna be the cane to our able. 
They hated our Savior. They persecuted him. And he tells us, because they persecuted me, they will persecute you. They will hate you. And hate begins, of all places, deeply within the human heart. Concocted out of sin, we desperately need a Savior. We desperately need the Holy Spirit continually working in our hearts. We need him because he points us to the one who is exemplified perfect love. And this is our contrast, our first contrast, right? Cain was of the father Satan. He was of Satan and he was wicked and evil. But by this we know love because he laid down his life for us. By this we know love because Jesus came the perfect love, the perfect one who lays down his life for us. And we see in Jesus, we see, not only do we see perfect love exemplified, but in, in believing upon his perfect love, he gives us his Holy Spirit who works within our hearts to enable us, to move us, to convict us, to transform us into people who love. Now, I'm gonna tell you, as I read this this week, I kept getting caught up on this one word. In verse 16, it says, and we also, in light of Jesus laying down his life for us, we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. I don't know why I like the word ought so much. I kept saying it, oughta, oughta. We oughta love. It felt right to me. So I kept telling people this all week. You oughta do this, you oughta do that. I don't know why this stuck out to me, but it stuck out to me so much so that as I prepared, I actually finished preparing and I went back afterwards because I, I looked at that word and I said, there's something important in this word that I think helps us tie together John's flow of thought. Stay with me here. I don't do this often because sometimes it can bog us down. I wanna give you a brief word study. Just look at this word ought with me for a moment. And I pray that this will drive us into the next, into the next verse. We also ought lay down our lives. Now, when we think of what we ought to do, I often think about just general, general responsibilities, kind of moral obligation. And in fact, the word here used for ought conveys the idea of being in debt or being under an obligation. And then I think back to the parable of the unmerciful servant. Stay with me. The unmerciful servant was forgiven a huge debt that he could never repay. But as soon as he was forgiven, he walked out and found another servant who owed him money and demanded his money back. When the master found out about the forgiven servant, he said, how could you do this to your brother? I forgave you this huge, incredible debt, and then you turned around and you, you were unforgiving towards your brother? We have an obligation that's been covered by Christ. But in covering our obligation, he gives us an obligation back to him. Do we not have a spiritual obligation to Christ? Right belief, right doctrine, right love. We want to, we should be, out of being his children, we ought to love him and love his creation and his people. I think there's another important step here with, with our ought, our understanding of ought. As we have this kind of obligation, we have this this debt, if you will, towards God, towards our brothers and sisters. I then think to Romans 13, eight, which says, owe no one anything except to love one another. Now our debt to Christ is to love one another. Our debt, having been forgiven, our debt, our, our what we ought to, our obligation as freed children of God is to love one another. This is where I think it gets very interesting. This is where it's gonna take us directly into the next verse. Obligation to love and care for one another without counting the cost because we have no debts between us naturally leads to our giving and sharing of our resources to each other. Now look at this, verse 17. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? And you might be saying, okay, now what's the connection? 
we go from an ought to lay down our lives to be willing to use our resources to care for and provide for our neighbor. Consider this. Your life may not be on the line on a daily basis, but if you use, well, they didn't ask my life of me, so I have nothing else to give. If that is your attitude, you're missing the bigger picture. Laying our lives down for our brothers and sisters, denying oneself of certain uh, pleasures and material goods in order to care for and be obligated to our Savior and his people. We should hold very loosely the things that we have in this world, our material goods, our wealth, because what if our brother needs us? In a time of need, how else can we help them? It doesn't have to be me giving my life. It may be me giving my life, but it can be very, very practical as well. And this leads us to another contrast. Whereas hate hardens the heart. He closes off the heart to the brother and sister. Love softens the heart and opens the heart to the brother and sister. We, 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 we see this right here. You, you have the means because whoever has the world's goods, so you've got the means. You see your brother in need. You're aware. You've got the means and you're aware of the need. But you've turned away, you've shut your heart, you've hardened your heart, and the question for that person is how, how can the love of God be abiding in you? How could you, in other words, how could you be that cold towards your brothers and sisters? Those people whom Christ, guided, Christ gave his life for, not even metaphorically gave his life, not just like had to deal with a lesser of two vacations or one vehicle instead of six, Christ gave his life on the cross. And we ought to lay our lives down. We ought to be obligated to care for and love one another. And we talk about this, don't we? Don't we talk about how, wouldn't it be great to be back like the, the church was early in the first century? We think of Acts chapter two where, where they shared everything. They, no one had need because within the body of Christ they cared for one another and they took care of one another. I'm not gonna be political this morning. However, we have created a society in which we've put the burden of caring for our brothers and sisters on the government's shoulders. Both directions, it's wrong. The church, my friends, beloved, the church should be the perfect picture of love in action through caring for one another's needs. Why would it not be? Why would it not be? This is what God has depicted. He's shown us in the way that he described and talked about the church. And so let us follow in that example, but let us also recognize that Christ's great love for me rescued me from the pits of hell, saved me, transformed me, gave me new life. So the least I can do, what I ought to do, is love his people up to and including giving my life for them. You know, there was a song that came out many decades ago, and I say many decades ago, and now I'm gonna tell you the song, and some of you are thinking, great, this is probably one from my childhood, and we're going to be dating ourselves somewhat. A song by John Lennon called Imagine. One of the verses in the song says this. Imagine no possessions, I wonder if you can. No need for greed or hunger, a brotherhood of man. Now, as catchy as this tune is, and I would lie if I said I've never sang along with this song in the car. I enjoy this song. But the premise of the song is faulty. If you listen to the first verse, what he leads with is an idea that in order somehow to have this, imagine no possessions, no greed, no hunger, his premise is what we gotta do to get there is get rid of religion. Imagine no heaven above us, no hell below us, no religion. And I'm saying that this is a terrifying and incorrect assumption. God all over scripture encourages us to not be greedy. He encourages us to be loose-handed with our possessions, to love our brothers, to provide and care for each other, to love each other that way sacrificially. Removing religion 
doesn't solve the problem. In fact, I would tell you that to remove the restraints of the Holy Spirit in the world, it would just descend humanity into absolute chaos. What we need is that true religion. We need that true faith, which James speaks of, where we visit the orphans and the widows and those in need. We need the true faith, the only faith, through the one person, the one mediator, the one savior, Jesus Christ. John, John Lennon's song should say, what if the world recognized the perfect love of the perfect savior? And because everyone was so moved into conviction by the power of the Holy Spirit, not only would they be rescued from hell and eternity and punishment, not only would their sins be forgiven, and not only would they have a righteous and right standing before a holy God, but here on this earth, as our bodies continue to decay, as we continue to press on into darkness, sharing the gospel, not only would they have all this, but they would love one another and they would care for one another. And there would be no need for greed or hunger. And we would be a brotherhood of Christ's people. We would be Christ's people. So we must heed, heed John's words as he says in verse 18, my little children, I love John. I feel like John is kind of like your, he's got that, that grandpa-esque voice. John wrote this late in the first century, very likely. He was probably quite old by that point, maybe 90s-ish, something like that. And I can just hear him, I can, just, I can even picture it in my mind, like especially with all of our kids in here this morning, with our kids sitting here listening or coloring. And they're sitting around, and I can just see, and I can just picture and imagine John with his disciples, those are who are following him, sitting around him, and him saying, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue. Don't, don't be all talk, but in deed and in truth, let us take the true faith and let's go actually express and care for our brethren. And there's one more contrast that I wanna point out this morning. And this one to me is, I feel like we're gonna finish on a mountaintop today. Because I feel like this is the one that as I read, I said, oh, that is the sweetness of salvation. In verse 14, John says, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Love for God abides in life through Christ. Love for death, or love for or hate abides in death. Not, not that we gain life by our loving others, but notice the word, because we love the brethren. Not that we gain life by loving others, but that our new life in Christ is evidenced by our love for our brothers and sisters. True love is always a circle that begins and ends with God. It's an unending circle. It always begins and ends with God. We can trace true love back to him every time. This is a beautiful thing to me because as John gives us the tough and tender talk, he's also giving us ways to have assurance in our life. I might mess up, <clears throat> correction, when I mess up, as I mess up, as I fail to live the way that I would desire to live, as Paul says, I do the things I don't wanna do, I don't do the things I should do, as I live that out in my daily life, God has gifted me something in my heart because as he's renewed me and convicted me through the power of the Holy Spirit working in my life, I can lean on that. And here's what it looks like. I love my brothers so much. I love my brothers and sisters in Christ so much. And my love grows, and it's not perfect, but it continues, and Christ sustains it so that when I look at you guys here on Sunday mornings and when I think about you in my office Monday through Saturday, 
and as I prepare God's word for you, and as I pray for you by name and think about you, and I'm loving you, Christ is drawing me in to him and giving me this awesome, awesome assurance that because I have this amazing love that he's gifted me, I can share it with you. His love is eternal, it's perfect. His love motivated coming to the world to rescue sinners. His love moved him and walked him straight to the cross. Eternally, even going back further than the incarnation here in our world, it is the Father's love that he gave his Son a people, a people whom the Son loved to death and then loved in resurrection life. A people that he loved so dearly that he sent the Holy Spirit to convict us, to transform us, to give us new hearts, to change us, to seal us eternally, and to intercede for us for the rest of our lives here and for all of eternity. It's an everlasting love that he's given us. So the final question that we have to consider this morning as we, as we begin to close, as we, as we close our Bibles and start to meditate and pray on his word is simple. This is the kind of love that our Savior has for us. How ought we live according to this love? And how can we pour it to others? And even this morning, as I prayed, there was something that came to my mind and I thought I would share it. And it was, it was quite simple. There are days where I don't feel like I have much love to give. There are days where I definitely feel like I'm on empty and I don't have anything left in the tank. And I know you guys probably have that same way. And here's just the thought that I had as I considered when I'm on E. I always have something to give because the God who loves me has poured an unending, unmeasurable cup of love into my heart. The key is abiding in him, trusting in him, loving in him, and being filled by him. If I do that, there is always something within me that I can give to others, always. He is ever faithful and ever present. That's my prayer for you this week. Let, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your perfect love. We thank you for this wonderful group in this body today. We thank you for giving us a place to gather and worship. We thank you for the freedom that you've given us in Christ to proclaim your word, to shower each other with your love, to, to, sh to, to show in some meager way the love that you gave to us, to others, God. I do pray that you would strengthen us and encourage us, God, as we go forward. Help us when we fall, stand us back up on our feet and take the next steps to look left and right here as we leave this morning and then to look left and right in our neighborhoods at home that we might love our neighbors as ourselves. All this we pray in Jesus' name, amen.